Dear ladies and gentlemen, as the current uh, president of the German Zoological Society, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this year's award ceremony of our society. This year, we have two awards. First, the award for the youngest zoologists, the Werner Rathmeier Award. And second, the most prestigious award in Germany for outstanding and interdisciplinary research in zoology, the Karl Ritter von Frisch Award. We begin with a presentation of the Werner Rathmeier Award. First of all, I would like to introduce Werner Rathmeier. Werner Rathmeier was a dedicated zoologist who worked on neuromuscular mechanisms in arthropods at the University of Konstanz. He also worked on animal toxins and their influence on nerve and muscle interactions. Before his time in Constance, he studied and worked at several universities, at university in Munich, in Seattle, and Frankfurt, and he wrote his habilitation thesis on prior reception in uh, wolf spiders, by the way, as I learned in preparation for this award ceremony. The DZG named an award after him because Werner Rathmeier was a very committed um, researcher that promoted young researchers uh, as well. For many years, he was a member of the jury of the Jugendforscht panel, meaning young people doing research, until he died prematurely at the age of 66. Since then, since 2004, uh, the German Zoological Society has endowed a prize in his honor for finalists in the Jugendforscht competition. What is Jugendforscht? It's a public-private initiative that aims at encouraging, inspiring, and supporting talented young researchers in STEM areas. It is a German-wide initiative with the motto, we are looking for the scientists of the future. The Walter Rathmeier awardees of this year, 2022, are Armin Höchel and Nikolaus Weiland. They are 15 and 16 years old. They are pupils of the Schüren Gymnasium in Pfaffenhofen. And I'm very certain that the school, the family, and your friends are very proud of you. They receive for the prize, yes. <laughs> They receive the prize for their study on birds with stomach problems. In this study, they found out that not only seabirds, but also other bird species have plastic in their stomachs, and that plastic content is related to the respective uh, hunting mode of the birds. They will now give us an insight into their findings, so let us dive into the gut contents of birds. Vielen Dank für die nette Einleitung. Also wir werden jetzt auf Deutsch sprechen, weil wir das so vorbereitet haben. Und genau, ich bin Nikolaus Weiland. Und ich bin Armin Hecker. Und wir haben eben als Jugendforschprojekt letztes Jahr das Projekt Plastik am Himmel Untersuchung von Spalballen im Bundeswettbewerb teilgenommen. Und wir sind auf die Idee gekommen, weil wir ja von dem Problem, dass Plastik schon oft in den Körpern von Fischen nachgewiesen worden ist, ähm, darauf gekommen sind, dass ja auch die heimischen Tiere, zum Beispiel bei uns in Bayern, wo jetzt kein Meer in der Nähe ist, unter der Plastikverschmutzung leiden sollten, müssen, leider. Und deswegen haben wir uns die Frage gestellt, ob Störche und Greifvögel und im Nachhinein auch noch Schleiereulen mit ihrer Nahrung auch teilweise Plastikteile aufnehmen. Dafür haben wir von mehreren Standorten, einmal aus unserem Landkreis Pfaffenhofen, den wir unterteilt haben in Landkreis Pfaffenhofen Nord und Süd, aber auch vor allem vom Ammersee und sogar Speiballen aus Mittelfranken, die uns zugeschickt worden sind, die Speiballen eingesammelt von den Storchenhorsten und aber auch aus dem Wald von Greifvogeln und später auch noch ähm, von Eulen aus dem Brutkasten. Zuerst haben wir äußere Daten erhoben, also wir haben die Feuchtigkeit der Speiballen gemessen, wir haben sie gewogen und vermessen äußerlich, haben dann über, das, über 3D-Modelle das Volumen der Speiballen berechnen können und dann so die Dichte berechnen können. Daraufhin haben wir die Speiballen nach einem strengen Ablaufplan seziert, damit unsere Ergebnisse auch vergleichbar sind. 
und rausgekommen ist, dass in 21 Prozent der Storchenspeiballen und in 17 Prozent aller Speiballen Plastik enthalten war, was bedeutet, dass in fast jedem fünften Speiball und bei fast jeder fünften größeren Nahrungsaufnahme Plastik mit aufgenommen wird. Das ist ein sehr erschreckender Wert, vor allem, weil ja eigentlich kein Plastik enthalten sein sollte im Optimalfall. Wir haben aber nicht nur auf Plastik untersucht, sondern auch noch auf Pflanzenteile, Käferreste, Haare, Steine, Sand und Knochen, sowie auf Federreste und eben die Plastikteile. Und es sind ganz eindeutig Unterschiede nach der Tierart zu sehen, was man einfach daran erkennen kann, dass das Nahrungsspektrum der Tiere sehr unterschiedlich ist. Außerdem konnten wir noch Unterschiede feststellen, je nach Ort, von dem die Gewölle stammten. So sind zum Beispiel äußere Daten, wie die Dichte, die hier beispielsweise aufgeführt ist, aber auch die Inhaltsstoffe, wie hier beispielsweise am Plastik, sehr unterschiedlich, je nach Gebiet, von dem die Speiballen stammen. Das heißt, die Umgebung der Tiere, in denen die Tiere ihre Nahrung suchen, beeinflusst logischerweise auch die Inhalte der Speiballen. Wir haben außerdem noch ein Zusatzexperiment gemacht, um feststellen zu können, ob die Knochen, die wir gefunden haben, aber auch die verschiedenen Plastikarten im Laufe der Zeit aufgelöst werden, also in der Magensäure der Vögel. Dafür haben wir Hühnerknochen, Haushaltsgummi, Polyethylentelephthalat, Polyamid, Polypropylen und Polystyrol für 10 Stunden lang in 1,3 pH-wertige Salzsäure eingelegt. Bei den Ergebnissen hier bei den Knochen können wir sehen, dass die Masse im Laufe der Zeit abnimmt, Jedoch sind das nur in etwa 0,7 Gramm. Da wir die gefundenen Objekte nur nach vorhanden oder nicht vorhanden eingetragen haben, also nicht gewogen, gehen wir davon aus, dass es keine signifikante Änderung in den Ergebnissen als Folge hätte, weil eine Abnahme von 0,7 Gramm jetzt nichts im visuellen Bereich wirklich ausmacht. Bei den verschiedenen Plastikarten können wir sehen, dass die meisten Plastikarten im Laufe der Zeit bei ihrer Masse nahezu konstant blieben. Nur das Polyamid, die gelbe Linie hier, ähm, es geht etwas nach unten, also das Gewicht, ähm, also die Masse sinkt wieder etwas, jedoch ist der Effekt auch sehr, sehr klein, deshalb gehen wir auch davon aus, dass das bei unseren Ergebnissen keine große Änderung zur Folge hätte. Zusätzlich haben wir noch eine Untersuchung auf Mikroplastik mit der Unterstützung von der Dr. Marco Kunas vom Landesamt für Umwelt in Wienbach gemacht. Dafür haben wir erst ganz normal, wie beim Sezieren, das Gewölle zerlegt und anschließend den Staub in ein Glas gegeben. Damit konnten wir einen oxidativen Aufschluss erstellen, sodass alle organischen Materialien zersetzt wurden. Mit einer Dichtetrennung konnten wir nochmals schwerere Partikel als die Mikroplastikpartikel ähm, trennen, was zum Beispiel jetzt Sand wäre. Und die restliche Probe wurde dann mit einem Infrarotspektrometer identifiziert und letztendlich konnten wir tatsächlich feststellen, dass zwölf Mikroplastikpartikel in diesem Speiballenstaub enthalten waren. Das war Polyethylen, Polypropylen, Polystyrol und styrol butadien -Kautschuk. Zusammenfassend können wir also jetzt sagen, zum einen, dass die Inhalte der Gewölle ortsabhängig sind, das hat Nikolaus auch schon anhand eines, Diagramm, ein, anhand eines Diagrammes gezeigt, wir können daraus schließen, dass die Umgebung der Steuenhorste, aber auch der Nester, der Greifvögel oder Schleiereulen, die das Nahrungsspektrum der Vögel beeinflusst. Und außerdem haben wir gesehen, dass fast jedes fünfte Schweiballen Plastik enthielt. Unsere Zusatzexperimente konnten das bestätigen und somit hat sich auch unsere Arbeitshypothese für die Störche bestätigt. Für die Greifvögel und die Schleiereulen hat sich die Hypothese nicht bestätigt. Eine Stichprobe konnte auch noch zeigen, dass tatsächlich Mikroplastik auch in den Gewöllen enthalten ist. Wir können daraus schließen, also wir können, ähm, ja, dass eben eine hohe Dunkelziffer wahrscheinlich vorhanden ist, da wir eben nur einen Speiball untersucht haben. Wir konnten dort drin direkt Mikroplastik finden und gehen deshalb davon aus, dass auch in weiteren Gewöllen durchaus ähm, Mikroplastik enthalten sein könnte. Hier sind noch, ist noch unsere Literatur, die wir verwendet haben und Quellen und vielen Dank für Ihre Aufmerksamkeit. Wir möchten uns auch noch mal recht herzlich bei der DZGB bedanken dafür, dass sie uns hier eingeladen hat und für den sehr herzlichen Empfang. for some uh, wonderful books here in the Sp uh, Springer uh, Nature, um, uh, from the Springer Nature Publishing House. Thank you very yeah. much.
Gabriele, this is not all. Oh. We, have some, <laughs> we have some local specialities. Oh. Sweets that are produced here exclusively in Bonn. And both of you get one sack of the <laughs> So the motto is apparently pick and party. Um, yes, before, before I move to, or we move to Dieter Tautz, um, I would like to talk about the Karl Ritter von Frisch Award. As mentioned before, it's the most prestigious award in German zoology. It is named after Karl von Frisch, who received the Nobel Prize in 1973, along with Nicolas Tinbergen and Konrad Lorenz. He investigated the sensory um, perceptions and spatial orientation of the honeybee and understood the diversity of, of the biological societies as a unity. The 2022 prize will be awarded to Professor Thomas Bosch from the Christian Albrechts University in Kiel for outstanding achievements in the field of aging and meta-organisms uh, research. His work transcends uh, disciplinary boundaries to achieve a profound understanding of zoological phenomena. With his groundbreaking work, Thomas Bosch has decisively shaped our understanding of host microbiome interaction and has firmly established the concept of the holobiont in zoology, in medicine, and I think I can say that in our society. Apart from Jugend Forscht, there is another initiative, the Biologie Olympiade, Biology Olympiad, or the Olympic Games for Biology. And the winner of the German Olympiad, and here we come full circle, is invited to spend four weeks in the lab of Thomas Bosch, I learned last night. Uh, uh, so um, these young researchers also get insights into research questions and methods in his lab. Thus, Thomas Bosch is inherently engaged in promoting and stimulating students to expand their talents and to promote their future career as scientists. Before I hand over uh, to, um, or, or now I actually hand over to Dietard uh, Tautz, um, but um, just to, to quickly say that this is the 21st Karl Ritter von Frisch Award of the German Zoological Society, and the award uh, consists not only of a certificate, but of a medal and a prize money, and this prize money is donated by the Inter Research Publishing House, represented today by the managing director, Volker Kraft. Uh, thank you so much for coming. And the Springer Nature Publishing House, represented by Stefanie Wolf, um, who is probably also here in the audience. Thank you also very much for being here. I think I would like to hand over the medal now, because there will be a little surprise afterwards. Um, so maybe we'll do this now. I will hand over um, the medal now, and then uh, Die Tartautz will give his, his um, laudatio, and afterwards we'll hear the talk by uh, Thomas Bosch. On the medal, you see Carl von Frisch. Very nice. <laughs> so, congratulations. Bunch of flowers is approaching. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. So we have to wait a little for uh, Thomas Bosch's uh, uh, talk, but now we will hand over to Dieter Tautz. He is going to give the laudatio. Yes, um, so dear Thomas, dear audience, um, yes, I'm, I'm, I'm proud to give this laudatio to you, uh, Thomas, and I would really like to have uh, come to Bonn but as you may have heard, uh, the pandemic also caught me, and so I have to stay in my home office here. Um, Thomas, um, we have both started in 1976 to study biology. You in Munich and I in Frankfurt. Funnily, since I grew up uh, close to Munich, I should have been starting in Munich as well, but the ZVS has brought me to Frankfurt, which was not too bad in the end, because that's where I met my wife. But uh, I wonder now in retrospect how our trajectories would have gone if we would have been study colleagues uh, from start. So, but uh, anyway, so it took until the 90s until we met in Munich. And um, um, it, it, it was certainly in the time in between you had um, uh, not only studied in Munich, but also in Swansea. University, you had then returned to Munich for a PhD, but then did a postdoc at the University of California at Ir Irvine, um, and then came back to uh, Charles David to become his star assistant. So that's uh, the time when I also moved to Munich, uh, and that's where we met, and that's where I met you first, and I met you as a person who was uh, always enthusiastic, always energized, and he, you were always fascinated by new techniques, and you had always a clear view of what, what you wanted to do next, what the next scientific question is. And that's that's a character that has not really changed up till now. So I, I still know you this way, and uh, I think you have not even aged in, in this respect. You have probably a very high FOXO concentration, I assume. Well. Your path took you from Munich to Jena and then at the turn of the millennium uh, to Kiel at the position that you have at the, uh, at the Mo in, at, that you have now. Um, again, I came only a few years later and I was very glad to meet you again because I knew you had already transformed the science landscape in Kiel quite a bit. So your enthusiasm has changed, has uh, things there, has um, introduced modernity modernity to, to the faculty and has really uh, attracted interesting scientists already. There is actually outside of the Biotorm, there is a wonderful new science building, which is a testimony of your activities there. And so I was very glad to meet you. And uh, since then, uh, we have had uh, quite some contacts with each other. Now, let's come to your science. You're, you always have stayed with your model organism with a freshwater polyp hydra. And uh, hydra is, of course, a very fascinating animal. It, it is a classic uh, developmental model organism where people have started to think about uh, morphogenetic gradients and how they provide the positional information in the, in the body plan. Your uh, contribution to the, to the model system was really your, your work on the stem cells. Um, you had already, during your diploma thesis, you had discovered that um, um, the uh, mechanism of growth control is uh, regulated by phagocytosis, which at that time was still a very poorly understood process. In your PhD, you went on to study immune cells, immune competence, and um, stem cells in particular. And stem cells also continue to be your, your favorite um, topic in the coming years. So one of the key findings you made very early on was, for example, that the female stem cells are the default pathways in Hydra, and that the male stem cells are derived from that, occasionally by spontaneous uh, redifferentiation. So we all know that the Bible has told us a different story. But uh, you showed uh, femaleness was the important part in, in Hydra. 
Well, you continued for many years, and that included then eventually also the, the discovery of uh, one of the uh, important transcription factors that maintain stem cellness, namely FOXO. And uh, you showed that this is functional in Hydra, both for stem cell maintenance and for and important for longevity. And in parallel, that was also found in humans. So uh, there was a clear proof again once more that this uh, uh, model system is indeed a model system for understanding basic principles of uh, biology. Well, stem cells was one of your big topics, but you always were looking out on other new topics. And uh, you had uh, the luck to have two wonderful PhD students very early on, Ingrid Endel and Jan Lohmann who started to study uh, head development in Hydra. We will come back to these later. Um, importantly, in your lab, you also developed the, the methods for targeted gene inactivation, in particular also transgenic Hydra, which was a big achievement and which then allowed you actually also to show that FOXO, uh, FOXO is, um, is a uh, functional component uh, of the stem cell uh, maintenance. Well, one other big topic in your career was um, uh, the question is was where new genes come from. Um, so emergence of new genes, particularly those that are specific uh, for single evolutionary lineages, and uh, you call them taxonomically restricted genes. Um, you have done uh, much work on that, and it happened to be that I was at that time also interested at the same topic, so we overlapped in, in some of our work. And interestingly, also in the end, we overlapped with one of our um, students, my PhD student, later postdoc, Tomislav uh, domaschet Lozo, then went to your lab and uh, tested one particular idea about the emergence of new genes, because uh, he found that he had found that uh, genes that are involved in cancer development um, have evolved at the time where multicellular animals emerged. And uh, so his prediction was there should be also cancer in Hydra. And this is indeed what both of you could eventually show. Hydra develops spontaneous cancer. And so proves also that uh, uh, cancer genes indeed, or cancer as such, are a, a, a accompanying uh, multicellular development right from the start of evolution. Well, coming to your main work today, so in 2010, you published a review that gave your research an, an other turn. The review was called Why Bacteria Matter in Animal Development and Evolution. And of course, at that time, most people still thought that bacteria are nuisance or pathogens and they have to be gotten rid of as, as far as possible. But uh, a, a number of researchers had understood that bacteria are far more um, and, and they are symbionts in very many ways uh, to the organism. And um, uh, this is, I believe, also your talk that you will give later. You were certainly one of the first to become excited of, about this idea, and you had completely very well understood that Hydra was an ideal organism to study this. And um, uh, that has really led to many new research directions and new research questions, and eventually also to the formation of the, the very successful SFB on the origins and functions of metaorganisms, which was very important to shape uh, also the science community in Kiel. Thomas, you're also an excellent communicator. Uh, I think the same way you approach your science, you also address the public, always enthusiastic, always with conviction. So you give lectures specifically tailored to, to school children. You have generated videos, digital visualization, online contributions in forums and uh, social media communication. You just published a paperback book, which is called Die Unentbehrlichen, Mikroben des Körpers verborgene Helfer. And I hope it will become a very successful book. Well, the great Charlie David was your mentor and has set you on your path. You yourself became also a mentor for others. Now we actually come back to Ingrid and Jan. Both are now called Lohmann by second names or they have married and both became very successful scientists. They are both have a chair at the University of uh, Heidelberg 
and they would really like to have um, been with you at this uh, uh, celebration. Unfortunately, they couldn't come, but they have provided a, a little video and with which they want to greet you. And this uh, video is now, so to speak, our surprise here for your um, uh, celebration and hope it can be started now. I think since you go on directly with your talk afterwards, I can again now congratulate you to this very extraordinary uh, achievement that you have uh, done during your life. You have more than earned the Karl von Ritter uh, von Fresh Award. Award. So many thanks to Dieter Tautz from the MPE. Uh, in Blöhn. Now we will move to Thomas Bosch's talk. Um, should we have a bit of music before? Would that be nice? Yes, please. <laughs> yes.
First of all, thank you very much for the music. Uh, it's wonderful and uh, brings a little bit of quietness in this uh, exciting and uh, complicated and, and uh, wonderful day. Um, dear colleagues, uh, dear President Gabriele, um, dear um, selection committee of the Karl von Frisch Medal, dear um, sponsors, Herr Kraft, Frau Wolf, it's a great honor that you're here in person. Uh, dear Dietat, for your very nice words, I was not aware how much we are interconnected. Um, dear Ingrid and uh, Jan, I know that uh, they met in my lab. I, I once found a note on my desk. I have to go to a vacation that was from Jan. A few hours later, I found another note from Ingrid. I have to go to a vacation. And they came back and they were engaged and a few months later they were married. Um, the organizers of the meeting here in Bonn, Thomas Bartolomeus and uh, the colleagues here, it was a fantastic meeting. I learned so much on biodiversity and uh, what uh, the urgent uh, questions are in these times. And, um, I'm very much impressed about after two years of Corona how many young people were here. This is your future and the field is your future and I'm very happy to see that the young people take that as the future field of their activities. But when I watched this one day and a half here on biodiversity mostly and the evening talk by Katrin was wonderful and the talk by Christian Scherber was wonderful and I had a short uh, coffee br uh, break um, communication with Thomas Bartolomeus, and I decided I have to change my talk. And I talk. Because we talk about biodiversity, but I think there is an elephant in the room. And the elephant is that in essence, everybody of you, every single creature on this earth, any plant, any invertebrate, any vertebrate, is actually microbial. 50% of your cells, which you carry around every day, two kilograms in your intestine, are bacteria or microbes, archaea, viruses, fungi, and others. 90% of the genes of a fly, which are within the fly, but not, not fly or drosophila genes per se, are microbial genes. We are meta-organisms. And I, I realize here, and a bit sad in Bonn, that we somehow ignore these facts. And what I really would like to close that evening with my talk here, a short talk, I promise you, and uh, only glossy slides and movies and nice things to listen, not complicated, is that when we talk about diversity, I strongly believe that microbial diversity matters most. And the solution of the problem of the loss of biodiversity in nature, which is a global problem and the most urgent problem of the 21st century, is a dilemma which starts in your body and starts in your bodies, in the individual bodies of your model organisms and in any creature of this earth. Now I'm back to my regular talk. When you get a Lifetime Achievement Award, I think it's fair and necessary, it makes me happy to think back. And uh, Dieter and, uh, and um, could I get a glass of water some more? Dieter and, uh, and um, Jan and Ingrid also mentioned, my scientific life started as a young student, a little older than Armin and Nikolaus, which I'm also very happy to hear. We had breakfast together. Um, I was a little older, but then I happened to come in the lab of Charlie and just played around, had all the freedom. We published a paper long before I had any diploma. The paper is still cited, and it was still a good observation. So I'm very thankful to Charlie David uh, that, he, uh, that he guided me in my first, uh, my first um, years in, in scientific life. And then later on, then I was habilitated in his institute and in his department in Munich which was a much imprinting um, experience. And by the way, it was the institute and the garden, which you see in the background, 
where Carl von Frisch made his experiments with bees, at least some of them. I'm also very thankful to another professor at uh, the University of Munich, which uh, passed away a long time ago, Maximilian Renner. Maximilian Renner was assistant to Carl von Frisch, and somehow it happened that he fascinated me because he gave lectures on general zoology, and in two semesters, winter and summer, he covered all the animal kingdom. There were not many students sitting in this lecture, but I found it fascinating. We had a pendant in the Botanical Institute with Professor Maxmuller, I think, and I always was thinking whenever I get in this type of job and condition, I would do the same, but I never happened, it never, I never managed, and I will never manage, and somehow I regret, because a deep understanding of the animal kingdom is the prerequisite for any uh, insight on molecular or genomic or transcriptomic um, data. So I'm very happy to, uh, thankful to Max Renner, and uh, I was a student helper with him, and we went every summer, we went to Croatia, in the marine station of, um, of uh, Rovin. And uh, we, we were snorkeling and we were going to the, thank you, vielen Dank. In einem Sektglas, großartig. So I learned a lot about, about that. And the third I have to thank is indirectly Karl von Frisch per se, but uh, through the hands of my father. My father was a dentist. He studied dentistry in Munich immediately after the war as a young student. He came back from St. Petersburg as an army soldier. And somehow he studied dentistry and he had biology lecture by Carl von Frisch. And he was fascinated by him and probably it would not be the necessity to take over the practice of his father. He maybe have also would have liked, uh, liked to become a scientist. And he had a book in his hands, Du und das Leben, von Carl von Frisch. It was probably the first popular book in German on uh, the fascinating observations of biology uh, at that time where physiology was something very new. And so young students like my father learned, oh wow, you get an understanding of how mechanistically organisms are starting to function. <coughs> the book is in my hands, in my study, in my home, and I pressure it very much. There's also gifts of the moment. Before I start, I have to thank a um, great deal of people, in particular in my current lab. Some of them are here and uh, have presented posters and short talks here. I'm very, very proud of them. And uh, I also like to thank my, my family. My wife is here and <coughs> my daughter is not here, but uh, without a family and without a wonderful group of team players and friends, nothing would have happened. Another type of gift my life was finding Hydra. I did that by chance through Charlie David. And of course at that time I never had any idea that I never will lose my hands on uh, of Hydra. I never did anything else and I always say to people, I never learned anything else but Hydra. Hydra was invented in 1750 by Abraham Tremblay. And uh, he was a Swiss naturalist and a private teacher to a rich, uh, actually, uh, a Danish family, I think. And he catched hydra, he cut them, and they regenerated, and he used that uh, to teach his students, private uh, kids from, from rich families, to, do so, to tell them, yes, there is de novo pattern formation, there is de novo formation of organs, animals can make something new, and nature can make something new which is not existing at that moment. If you cut off a hydra two days later, it has a foot. That was um, astonishing at that time because it was the time of the preformists, and the, the, the Roman Catholic Church told everybody there's only things that are existing on this earth which are given from, by God. There is no de novo generation of something. Tremblay, using Hydra, was one of the first who disproved that. He wrote a wonderful book which has pictures which are fascinating and which are valid today. We can just copy paste them and put them in our laboratory practicals and they are still uh, valid. Of course, to understand an organism deep, it needs uh, uh, energy, creativity, 
and people who like to go with you along these lines to transform them in a molecular world. And as Dieter had said, I guess some of the um, real breakthroughs was that we achieved finally to make transgenic animals. And uh, so that happened finally in 2006. To the young people here, I want to say, it took me 10 years to get to that single paper. And it took me a, a Humboldt Fellowship, a German Science uh, Foundation Fellowship, etc. I always was funded, but I never succeeded until I found a wonderful technician and colleague, Georg Wittlieb, he's the first author of the first paper. He's still with me in Kiel. And he finally thought, well, the only thing which we now can do is embryo microinjection. And that's what we did. The method is still valuable. And we just together with Alexander Klimovich have um, updated the version in a nature protocol uh, paper. And at that time, it was also very essential as very moved by this video from Jan and Ingrid. Um, because both of them did very independent in the lab, very, uh, very important work towards understanding what is this patterning going. In the meantime, we know that this organism is simple, evolutionary old, sister, belongs to the sister group of old bilaterians, and essentially consists only of three major cell types, which have their base on three independent stem cell lineages. Two of them are unipotent, one is multipotent, the animals are very simple to keep in the lab, um, and compared to mouse or fly or any other facilities, um, just uh, little creatures living in plastic dishes. And um, in essence, the animals, uh, that's what I have written then later, and that will become, at the end of my talk, a nothing but a stem cell community, because the whole tissue is nothing but stem cells, and that's the, the enigma and the secret of their um, continuous self-renewal capacity because all the cells, about 100,000 cells per polyp, and 80,000 cells of these probably are stem cells. And so it's a wonderful tissue to, uh, to really go to in vivo biology of um, stem cells. And uh, so we have understood, we and with many other labs around the world, we now have understood this animal uh, as a model system for developmental biology. It has a top and a bottom. We know the genes, the signal transduction cascades. There's an organizer, the wind organizer at the, the top of the animal here. This was mostly discovered by Thomas Holstein in Heidelberg. And uh, so uh, this is, uh, all of that is discovered. And actually, you can get a little, a little proud or maybe also a little overambitious and say, well, what do we need to make an animal? Maybe this is simple enough that we really can understand how to make an animal. Now in 1992, a book at that time famous, and the older colleagues in the room can, uh, may, remind, uh, may also have uh, seen that book by uh, uh, Peter Lawrence, came in my hands, and that was entitled The Making of a Fly. I thought, wow, there's somebody writing a book and he claims that he can say how a fly is made. I found that quite provocative. And at the very end, I will tell you, of course, we still do not know how to make a fly. But what we know is that organisms are certainly much more complicated than we think because they have an invisible part to them. And that invisibility of the major part makes me to speak to you today and makes me to speak nearly every week to the public and makes me to publish books. Because I think it's the, this invisible part is as essential as the visible part to understand physiology, evolution, functioning, and fitness of organisms. We consider organisms as meta-organisms because we think they are a multi-organismic, we know they are a multi-organismic association of many different other small invisible creatures mostly prokaryotes, but also some uh, eukaryotes, some viruses, fungi, and uh, all of that together is the organism you see and is the organism which you have in your hands. And about uh, 150 years of biomedical research has focused exclusively on the host. And I was a bit sad these days because I still see that tendency that you exclusively see the host, but I can tell you the host and nothing 
We had a wonderful lecture this morning, the mind of a bee, but I can predict that the, what, the, what the bee or the humble bees are really doing is in part determined by what's going on in their gut with their gut microbiome. And uh, so we have to see that as an entity, uh, and that's what we call uh, the holobiont. And it's really, and the last uh, sentence down here, it is the animal condition to have microbes. Dear zoologists, there is no animal which has no microbes, and the microbes are important, is what drives me to publish, uh, to publish books for the general public. I'm very happy, of course, to have uh, financial support throughout my life, and uh, most recently, and since a couple of years, um, I'm chairing the Collaborative Research Center Origin and Function of Meat Organisms in Kiel, and we have a, a wonderful new research building. Uh, this is my office in the old building, and the young generation sits in the new building here. Uh, and uh, we have funding uh, from the German Science Foundation. I was I'm a fellow of the Wissenschaftskolleg, and I'm most inspired by being, since many years, fellow in a think tank in Canada, the Canadian Institute of Advanced Research. What is the meta-organism hydra? It is essentially the cells which my colleagues and my students all know. It's uh, the ectodermal epithelial cells, for example, or the endodermal cells. But then outside, these cells secrete uh, mucosa, uh, what we call a glucocalyx, and it is slimy, invisible layer. It's even electron microscopically different. You have to do cryofixation to see this layer, and that's what we did many years ago. This is the habitat of thousands and thousands of uh, distinct different species of microbes. They live outside the ectoderm and they communicate with themselves. It's a distinct, diverse community and they communicate with the epithelium. You can make them visible right now, uh, electron microscopically. Actually, here's, here you see the mesoglea. These are five layers. The same layer is in your gut. There's five layers, and in the gut also the bacteria are sitting in the most outer layer, outer layer, and then um, uh, before they come to the intestinal stem cells, or in our case, to the ectodermal stem cells. So it's a dense community, and you cannot separate that, and now we can uh, come back to that in the later part of my talk, we can remove them. But then, and we can remove in many organisms, now the bacteria, we call them germ-free. We have a gnotobiotic facility in Kiel. There's thousands of cages where you keep germ-free mice. They are not normal. In nature, there is no germ-free animal, but they are wonderful uh, models for understanding the role of the bacteria. The probably the two most the most important papers, which um, my lab came out in that respect was the very first paper by Sebastian Fraune. He's now professor in Düsseldorf, uh, and myself in 2007, and then that was a more extended study then by another student, uh, Søren Franzenburg and uh, colleagues from the Kiel lab, where we found that if you take different species along the phylogenetic tree of Hydra, and that is the most ancient species, and that is the most recent species here, and we do sequencing and determination of the microbiome we find distinct microbiota. You see here di different colored cakes, but you see that the cake is very much different. The more different you get, uh, you, the more dis uh, distant you get along the phylogenetic tree. And the oldest, this is Hydra viridissima, very distinct microbiome from, the, uh, from a more recent species. So different species have different microbes. When Sebastian came to my lab, and showed me that first observations when we came up, I think it was first his diploma, and then he did his thesis there. I, thought, I told him, I don't believe a single word, because that's impossible. Because I, we keep all the species in the lab in plastic dishes. Artificial food, artemia, to eat. And they traveled with me throughout the world for about 20 or 25 years before we made that study. How can you maintain distinct bacteria when you have identical culturing and feeding conditions? No way. Go out in the wild, find the same type of species again, and do the sequencing again with freshly collected polyps. That is very tough from a thesis advisor, because at that time I had no idea if Sebastian ever would find animals in North Germany somewhere in any pond. 
He did, and he confirmed what we found in the lab. And that was astonishing, because it means that animals does just stick to their microbes. And unfortunately, if some of the guys get in a plastic dish for 20 years and get some artificial food, doesn't matter. We need these bacteria to make our own physiology, so we keep them. And even, uh, even uh, closely related species have somehow distinct microbiomes. If that's true, and it is true, and people later on found that in many different organisms, including humans and great apes, Howard Ochman um, published paper in Science some years later shows clearly there's a Homo sapiens core microbiome which distinguishes you from chimpanzees and orangutan, etc. And today we do not need to see any person anymore. We need a little piece of shit. We sequence that, that we know what we have in front of us. It's sequence specific. But if that's true, then you have to think about that it means something. There must be a role for these microbes. And I'll give you a few examples in the next few slides. And the most important message for that next few minutes is these microbes are part of the innate immune system. And if you remove them, the animals are sick. And all what we find in Hydra is true for humans. And if you remove the microbes from your body, you get sick. And I will show you an example later. The first came very early on, um, again with Sebastian, and there we succeeded in simple ways at that time to make, bacteria, to make polyps bacteria-free. And uh, the study was actually done by, Sebastian, by Sören Franzenburg in this, in this paper here. And Sören came to my lab, and first we had germ-free animals, champagne. Great, not easy to do. Three days later, Søren came back to the lab and said, Thomas, we have a problem. And I said, what's the problem? All our animals have fungi. We never have fungi in the lab. I said, shit, why do they have fungi? Until it came to us that the only difference between here and here is that these guys have no bacteria. We removed them. And because we, since we removed them, we have removed a layer, and this is now schematically the glucocalyx and the different balls, the different colored balls are the different microbes. They all interact with each other, and they produce something, and there is a sporidium coming here, and this is the ectodermal epithelial cell, and the sporidium is approaching this uh, epithelium here, and this guy, is, this, this microbiota is the protective layer which produces an antifungicide or closes space so that the fungi cannot settle there. We call that colonization resistance. And the animals are happy. But if you remove that, because you use antibiotics to make them germ-free, then the fungi can just go into the tissue and antibiotics don't work for the fungi, and so they kill the animal. This is what I would like you to get from this wonderful uh, it's a game meeting here in Bonn. This is what we have seen in the last few days a lot. This is the species loss and the loss of biodiversity, and this is how it should be. Think about that the same happens in your body. This is how it should be. And the red arrows are most important because the red arrows show that it's not enough to have a single species. You need a diversity of microbes we checked all that by monocolonization of polyps. It's just one bacterium. Nothing happens in terms of colonization resist resistance or pathogen defense. You need the mixture. You need, a, you need a rich mixture to have full protection. And um, if we don't have that anymore because of loss of diversity, biodiversity, microbial biodiversity, then we have trouble. When you've been in the dentist in the last three days and he said, you have parodontitis, this is not so good news. Then he did some mechanical scratching with your teeth. Uh, and then he sent you home and gave you some oral uh, antibiotics. And then today in the morning you looked in the mirror and then you saw, oh my God, I have thrush. Candida grows in your mouth. You never have, you always have candida at a low number, but you never have has these plaques of candida 
growing in your oral cavity. You only have them if you kill the local microbiome in the oral cavity, which is very specific and also very complicated, and by the way, systemic connected to the, to the gut microbiome. When you remove that by oral, bio, uh, by oral antibiotics, inhabitants, which are not affected by antibiotics, like the fungi, they grow. Biodiversity is essential in your body as it is everywhere in the, in the, in the world and in the animal kingdom. So now you can ask, how is this specificity maintained? And uh, I only can give you some glimpse, and Dietard mentioned that we discovered the FOXO transcription factor, which is a very important transcription factor in this respect. Um, but if you see that as the meta-organism, then you have to ask, how do they maintain this specific microbiome? And there another surprise came. I was interested for some time in the evolution of the immune system that actually was a logical pre-stage activity before what we did in the last 20 years. And the classical evolutionary old innate immune system goes with a toll-like receptor, an MID88, where is it? MID88 adapter, and then nf kappa B transcription factor, and then antimicrobial peptides are activated, get uh, made as proteins, get secreted, and as antimicrobial peptides, the name says, antimicrobial, they kill microbes. That's how we saw them. I chaired a Gordon conference on antimicrobial peptides with the idea these are killers. Yes, they are killers. But what they really do is they shape the beneficial microbiome by killing the ones which grow too fast uh, or, of course, by removing uh, microbes which don't belong to that community. This machinery is extremely extended in terms of genes and gene families, and for that reason, for an organism, very expensive to make. We have hundreds, maybe thousands of genes in Hydra and in many other organisms which make antimicrobial peptides, but there are only very few pathogens. So what are they really doing? And the long story and the answer I told you already is that antimicrobial peptides produced by the host shape the microbiome. And uh, together with Mike Tseslov, uh, we did a, a, a literature search and we come to the conclusion that this is really in general true. And we have examples from, uh, from Hydra and from the flies and from vertebrates and from humans. This is the function of your antimicrobial peptides. Yes, there are pathogens. And yes, they are killed by antimicrobial peptides. But the vast majority of the function of the antimicrobial peptides is to, to maintain the menagerie of the beneficial microbes. And if you have a genetic problem in making an antimicrobial peptide, in your case, defensins, then uh, you have continuously the wrong microbiome and you may develop chronic inflammatory bowel disease. So, Immune system and antimicrobial peptides and toll-like receptors are not so much there for pathogen events in terms of evolutionary uh, time, but mostly to maintain this meta-organism and its beneficial microbes, a door opener for symbiotic interactions. And another unexpected player came into. These are the nervous systems. The animals are beautiful for studying the nervous system. They have about 3,000 neurons. We know all of them by first name. And when, you, when I ask you what's the function of the nervous system, it's very clear. Sensory input and motor output. Today I will say this is not sufficient because the nervous system, again, is a major part and partner of, our, of your immune system. And what you see in this picture are beautiful hydra neurons. Blue are the blue are the nuclei, and the red, the red spots here are bacteria. And I told you that the, bacteri that the bacteria are sitting outside the animal. And uh, so funny enough, here these are sensory cells, these are ganglion cells, this is the ectoderm. The sensory cells are peeking out in this, muco in this mucosa, in this glycocalyx layer, where the microbes are sitting. 
since today there is so much memory on old times, when I was in Charlie's lab as a student and did a lot of microscopy and histology, I always wondered why the hell do these animals have sensory neurons peeking out along the body column? That makes no sense. If, the, if they are activated there, what the hell are they doing? The food comes only from there. Now we know these neurons communicate with the, with the, um, with the microbiome and actually they contribute to maintain the microbiome in a given shape as the immune system. This is one of the first direct examples. It's done by a former postdoc in the lab, René Augustin, and René discovered in neurons that they produce a, a molecule which clearly is an antimicrobial peptide. We call it neuronal-derived antimicrobial peptide one. And uh, this was then confirmed and extended by a beautiful study by Alexander Klimovich and Alex did single cell transcriptomics and sorted the neurons of Hydra and submitted them to a deep transcriptional analysis. And what we found is that these cells indeed, the neurons have, the, of course they have all the neuronal genes, but in addition, they have tons of classical immunorelevant uh, components from the lectins to the toll-like receptors to antimicrobial peptides. And, and Alex gave a short talk yesterday, to novel genes. And here is the stem cells, and here are the neurons, and here is the percentage of uh, TRGs, what we call them ta um, taxonomically restricted genes, and neurons express many of these novel genes, which Dieter also mentioned. And I think Dieter and my lab is the only lab which works on that genes, which are so important because they're only found in a taxon-specific manner. But when we then, the problem why no, people don't like to work on them is because it's very hard, because you cannot make any predictions. What are they doing? So you have to individually submit them to causal analysis, transgenesis, gene loss, gain of function, etc. Today, we are better in shape, and uh, so we have machine learning. So we ask computers with colleagues in, in California, and they, we give them sequences of novel genes, and then they predict and they came up with a prediction, many of them could be antimicrobial peptides. And then Alex and others in the lab tested that. And yes, these novel genes in neurons, uh, many of them are indeed antimicrobial peptides. I tell you that because also I want that these things are not forgotten. And the new generation, the young generation here should remember that novel or young genes or orphan genes are different different uh, names for them, play an important role, but nobody's interested in, in them. But you will only understand your animal if you take them in consideration. There is an old paper from my lab uh, where we got on the cover of, uh, of Trends in Genetics uh, that uh, more than just orphans, they are really important. And to sum up that part in the neurons, a neuron, and this is uh, published in BNS as a prototypical pacemaker cell, is composed of conserved parts, of novel parts, and it interacts with the microbiome and many signals which, which maintain the functionality of the cells come actually from the outside, and it's the same in cnidarians as it is in vertebrates and in many other organisms. Same genes, same cell types, and same uh, concepts. So, another surprise. Whoever had thought 20 years ago that the nervous system really is involved in host microbiome interactions? And there's a lot to rethink these days, but that is also the fun in science. In the very last chapter, I quote a citation from a very good peer of mine who also passed away a long time ago, Pierre Tardon. Uh, Pierre was a professor at Zurich, and he always reminded us, young, queasy generation of uh, Cnidarian enthusiasts, to learn new things, read old books. I like to repeat that, and I give you an example, and this is now unpublished work uh, from my lab. Um, and the old work is not an old book, but an old paper in science, 40 years old, by a Jewish colleague whom I had the pleasure and honor to meet personally, Menachem Rahat. And Menachem published a paper in science some time ago 
40 years ago, missing budding factor in non-symbiotic hydra. That was in science. It was forgotten. Nobody ever read it. When we came to that topic, we picked it up. We couldn't repeat it. And then we took it away. And uh, okay, you know, there are a lot of things in your life which you then better ignore to not waste time. So Rahat and Menachem and Rahat and Rimetman, uh, Dimetman, proposed that the missing budding factor, which is the essential part of keeping the hydro machinery going, was provided by food or by bacteria. And food or bacteria always go together. The, ne the experiment never has, was repeated, and the factor never has been characterized. Until a gifted um, first graduate student and now postdoc, Jin Ruhi, came in the lab and took up this task of digging into this old book. And he succeeded by, first of all, spending one year of making a long-term germ-free culture. Jin Ruhi now has germ-free animals for more than three years. And uh, what he discovered is that, yes, this is a normal, this is a different controls, this is germ-free, but from this germ-free animal, it looks pretty, still pretty normal. Uh, if you wait a few weeks, then these animals get a bit fatter, larger, stop budding, and get extraordinary phenotypes with all kinds of patterning problems. The phenotype is reversible. If you give back the bacteria, the animals start to bud again, and then these buds fall off and a normal polypet hatches. What's going on? I summarize now about three years of work, which is still not yet published. So we did single cell transcriptomic with stem cells because the, the secret of a tissue homeostasis is always in the cells which make the tissue. Hydra has three stem cell lineages. So we did a full single cell transcriptome analysis of every single cell in these animals, came up with a cell atlas, which you see here, no details, doesn't matter. But then we compared the germ-free non-budding versus the germ-free animals. And the germ-free non-budding animals are these guys here. And uh, so these are all, you can consider them as controls. And what you can see here is these are populations here as the ectodermal stem cells, the endodermal stem cells here, the interstitial stem cells, and the, and the nematocytes, and the gland cells. And you, this is what we, that is very familiar to, to us. But what we never saw is there is a new class of stem cell population popping up in animals which have for a considerable period of time no microbes. And this is true in all the stem cell lineages. This is the, um, if I can read that light here, this is the endodermal, and this is the ectodermal uh, lineage here. So this is the normal population. And if you transfer that, uh, then you see here a new population. So of course we ask, what the hell do the microbes do that stem cells move in a different direction as identified by gene expression profiles. And what we came up is with thousands of different genes, of course, and when you look then carefully which type of genes are then here involved, then you read familiar names, WIND, FGF, and others. All the major classical, how to make an animal, uh, the builders of the body plan, they are dysregulated if microbes are not there anymore. And then Jinro did something really challenging. He did cell trajectory analysis of the stem cells, and he can follow a single stem cell on the way from the old population, and here is then the absence of the microbes, to the new population. And then you, you can see how they change with time their identity in terms of gene expression repertoire. So the cells move into different directions, which reminds you, of course, on Waddington's landscape, and there is a cell here. It can go in this valley or in this or in this valley here. And this is always taken in every textbook as the epigenetic landscape, remember? But what is epigenetic? Epigenetic is the Google translator of, of environmental signals. And the environmental signals are here the landscape. And all what we want to say now, and we are now writing this paper, is that microbes are a major part of the environmental signal 
uh, inducers and obviously directly informing stem cells what to do. And if they are not there, then stem cells make a slightly wrong decision. And we can move that on. And we are now in the, uh, we are now have the potential to go in thousands of different genes. This is before the transition. This is after the transition. And these are the genes now which are in the transition differentially regulated. And among them are the drivers of this uh, decision. And we are doing at the moment function analysis, transgenic analysis to determine uh, which are the key drivers. There are transcription factors and there are extracellular matrix mo uh, proteins and others. Last surprise. Accident in the lab. Jinru went on vacation and he stopped feeding. A Chinese postdoc never goes for a long vacation. He came back three days later and he watched his animals and they started to butt again. Stop feeding, and they burst with butts. I never saw a phenotype like this in my life before. And it tells you that if you uh, stop feeding in these artificial microbe-free animals, something is released finally, and they can stop. Uh, they can finally make pattern formation again. Now, our current hypothesis is that in normal case, when microbes are there. There is something accumulating because of the food, and this is removed, scavenged by the microbiome continuously. And so then the host makes its normal development and wind goes on, etc. But if the microbes are missing, then something is accumulating, which is hindering your developmental machinery to do the normal job. Then you get your abnormal phenotype, scavenger hypothesis. I come to the end and I conclude that organisms function as metaorganism, that developmental mechanisms evolved in the presence of colonizing microbes. Microbes were first, 3.5 billion years. These oldest creatures and metazones are only 560 million years. And microbes play an elemental role in animal development. What I want to say to the young generation is that there is a fundamental paradigm shift and a new era emerging in the way that we think about animal development. Our host-centric view will inevitably fade and development as the interplay between an animal host and a multitude of microbial prokaryotes will emerge as the rule. As such, animal developmental biologists must switch from an isolated view of a discipline to one that includes this dimension. Do we understand how to make a fly? I did a small calculation before I came here. Drosophila contains 13,600 genes, and some of you are studying them very carefully. May I add that Drosophila melanogaster also has 120,000 microbial genes in the gut of the fly. So these are 90% of the fly gene. And there is no reason to believe that the fly is not a meta-organism. So we should actually move from a monocausal thinking and our, holistic, our too little holistic consideration of the body to a holistic con uh, consideration indeed beyond the genes of the body of the animal you consider and the metabolic pathways. At the very end, I come back to Karl von Frisch. I have the book in his hands, and I open the book, and on the very first page, there's a poem. And I read it, um, now in German, of course. Schau mit offenen Augen nur in die lebende Natur, findest Stoff für alle Zeit, Und du lernst Bescheidenheit. Dankeschön.
you, Thomas. This was an inspiring talk, and I think there's nothing more to say but to listen to a piece of music. And after that, we'll have a champagne reception, and we will postpone our general assembly to quarter past. <laughs>